This video is brought to you by Devout Decals, makers of reusable Catholic art for your home altar, your bedroom, and your home classroom. If the episodes I've brought you over the last week or so are any indication, we've entered the season where the better bishops write letters on the topics of the day and address them to the general public, and they do so to correct errors in the church and in the broader world. And today I have yet another. Cardinal Walter Brandmuller, a theologian cut from the same cloth as Benedict XVI, has issued a letter calling out the errors of the synod in Germany, and he calls the architects of that synod to repentance. Some of what he says is theological in nature, but the overall point he's making is this, and it's pretty clear. The road the German bishops are going down leads to no faith, but dressed up in the Catholic faith, and reduces the church to a social services organization. In other words, Cardinal Brandmuller is saying what many of us have been saying for some time now, and it is definitely a welcome sign for a retired cardinal of his stature to be repeating the same things that many of us are saying. The retired cardinal invokes modernism, Pope St. Pius X and Pius XII explicitly, and he asks at the start if the German bishops know that what they are engaging in is condemned by the church. Think about what he is implying there, and I'll go over this a bit more at the end. Without further delay, Here's the letter of Cardinal Brandmuller to the German bishops and to the general public. Quo Vadis Germania by Walter Cardinal Brandmuller. So now the German synodal path has reached its first milestone. As is to be expected, the drafted texts make demands that are in clear contradiction to the authentic Catholic faith, to the hierarchical sacramental constitution, and to the binding moral teachings of the Church. All of this was, quote, decided with a large majority. The fact that quite a few of these yes expressions came from bishops shows the seriousness of the situation and raises fundamental questions. It was certainly no longer surprising to find among the reforms decided there the abolition of celibacy as well as the admission of remarried divorced people to communion, etc. All this has been pending since the Würzburg Synod of 1971, which was never confirmed by the Holy See. What is new, however, is that practiced James Martin things is recognized as morally permissible. The fact that no real difference should now be recognized between ordained bishops, priests, deacons, and, quote, only the baptized and confirmed, on the other hand, corresponds entirely to Martin Luther's teaching. However, Vatican II teaches that the ministerial priesthood, that is, the hierarchical priesthood of the consecrated, differs not only in degree but in essence from the common priesthood of the baptized. So the Frankfurt Assembly is repealing 2,000 years of practice and a general council, and also calls for the sacrament of holy orders to be given to women, which in 2,000 years was never thought possible because, as John Paul II has stated with infallible judgment, the Church has no authority to administer the sacrament of holy orders to women. These, then, are the spectacular demands of the fellow travelers in Frankfurt, which arouses as much enthusiasm in official Catholic circles as they did in ordinary Catholics. The frightening question arises, did the bishops who took part in the decision-making process really not realize that they were in open contradiction to the truths of faith which they had repeatedly sworn to faithfully preserve and proclaim with a holy oath? This question of ultimate existential seriousness must be asked with all severity, and answered by every bishop. The community of believers has a right to that. In order to assess the seriousness and scope of this question, it is now necessary to trace the roots of the crisis that came to light with Frankfurt. Looking back at this beginning at the end of the 19th century, we encounter the phenomenon of modernism. What is really at stake here is the fundamental question of the nature of religion. What actually is religion? Pius X came up with a collective term, modernism, for a series of attempts to answer this, which were discussed especially in France and England around the turn of the 20th century. It was a heterogeneous complex of ideas, approaches that were and are incompatible with the Catholic faith in different ways. One might think of attempts to illustrate the meaning of human existence, to cope with the experience of human finitude, to the primal experience of the depths of the person, the unconscious or subconscious, etc. There is also another constitutive element, that of evolution, and each individual sages are also subject to evolution, both as individuals and as societies. But in these cases, according to Hegel, this occurs in the three steps of thesis, antithesis, and synthesis. But that means that what was false yesterday could be true today, and vice versa, only to be questioned again in the next step, and so on. This is how development takes place, also of religious consciousness, to the ever higher level of the respective time. Be that as it may, in any case, it is about the I that experiences, understands, articulates itself, fixed on himself and revolving around himself, locked in himself, a lonely monologue. 
Now, it would have been an extremely urgent task for theology to deal with these tendencies and the reaction of the Church's teaching authority to them. Think of the encyclical Pascendi and the decree lamentabili of Pope Pius X in a serious, unexcited way. However, this is not what happened. This was a truly tragic consequence of the rapid political, cultural, and economic development in the Western world, which was soon to collapse in the great catastrophe of the First World War. The old powers were replaced by, uh, by totalitarians, whose clash in World War II led to the almost complete collapse of Europe. Another consequence of this was inter arma silent musee, i.e. where the guns speak, the muses are silent, that the theology in the first half of the 20th century turned less to the fundamentals and more to the topical of the moment. However, this did not lead to a thorough and comprehensive examination of the complex phenomenon of modernism. However, the problem continued to smolder underground. The crisis finally broke out in the run-up to the Second Vatican Council, followed by serious ruptures in the faith and life of the Church. Reference is only made to the Nouveau Theologie, to which Pius XII responded with his encyclical Humani Generis. Soon after, the now growing generation of the 1968 generation, who in turn set the tone in Frankfurt, tried. For example, the clinical findings for the patient German Church, a non-governmental organization, NGO, with humanitarian cultural goals, a stated artifact limited to the here and now, circling on itself and superfluous. But man, according to a comparison for mathematics, is neither a straight line without a beginning and an end, nor does he resemble the distance that is limited by both. Rather, it is like the ray which has a beginning but no end. Man does not exhaust himself in his earthly life. According to Judeo-Christian belief, he is the creature and image of that infinite spirit whose will brought everything into being. But religion is the way in which the human being responds to it, recognizes and encounters its creator. Religion is not mono, but essentially dialogue. With such considerations, we are certainly still moving on the level of natural religion, which results from the recognition of finiteness, of man's created, and establishes an existential relationship of worship and devotion to the Creator. There is still no mention of Christianity. Have these things been taken for granted? One asks oneself in amazement and dismay. Have the fellow travelers in Frankfurt actually lost them? Don't the synodals notice that they are on the wrong track that is going nowhere? In the end, the company Synodal Way had a fatal balance sheet. The Frankfurt Papers were no longer just about heresy and heresy. Hardly anything wrong is said about God in these texts. But God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit simply don't appear in it anymore. But that means Atheism and Christianity, as the title of Ernest Bloch's book from 1968 already says, he, Bloch too, is a Frankfurter. On the other hand, we hold firmly... Religion in the Judeo-Christian understanding is not the result of human self-experience or existential reflection, but the response of the human being to self-communication, the revelation of the Creator to his human being, a call from beyond the created, recognizable as such to mankind, to the chosen people, Israel, in the course of history. In retrospect, it becomes clear how in the religious tradition of this people an ever clearer, more sublime image of the Creator of man and universe was recognized from what were initially rather shadowy forebodings. St. Paul introduces his letter to the Hebrews with the words, God once spoke to the fathers in many different ways through the prophets, but then he continues, at the end of these days he spoke to us through the Son. The Son is the historical Jesus of Nazareth, whose last years of life, whose death on the cross, took place in the brightest public light, and are much more extensively documented than those of his most prominent contemporaries. These testimonies are the writings of the New Testament. Research agrees that the majority of these were written and disseminated while they were alive by people who were contemporaries of the events reported. There is therefore no reason to doubt their historical statements. In short, faith in Jesus Christ, the incarnate Son of the living God, is not based on ideas, myths, but on verifiable historic facts. From the number and enthusiasm of the eye and ear witnesses of the events surrounding Jesus of Nazareth, the risen Christ built his church on Peter, the rock, which the Apostle Paul was soon to present as the body of Christ, as a living organism animated by the Spirit of God, the new way of the presence of the risen Lord in this world, and there is not a single word about death, judgment, and eternal life in the modernist documents. And now the astonishing and disturbing statement, none of this plays a role in Frankfurt. But what is understood there by religion, Christianity, the Catholic Church? Indeed, atheism and Christianity. Church, is it then indeed not only a social, cultural, and among so many others, superfluous NGO? Return, O Israel, to the Lord your God. See Hosea chapter 14, verse 2. Signed, Cardinal Walter Brandmuller. Pretty stern words, no? Brandmuller calls out the modernists and invokes St. Pius X and Pius XII, 
calling the leaders of the synod modernists and then even mentioning heresy explicitly. It's a strong accusation to make because modernism is a formally defined heresy, and it is why at the start of his letter he asked the hypothetical question of whether the bishops involved know that they are preaching heresy. Because if they do know, then they are formal heretics and no longer in the church. As I said at the start, this is a heavy accusation with not terribly subtle things being said about the bishops. It's actually refreshing to see, even if Cardinal Brandmuller is a proponent of a rather conservative reading of the council that caused the current mess in the church that we're in. I'm curious what you think about this. That now marks three letters from German and Polish bishops that I've presented to you in the last week that are trying to talk some sense into their brothers in the Episcopate in Germany. And am I right? Does this letter really apply to the entire church? That's my contention here. Let me know in the comments what you think of this. And like and subscribe if you haven't, it really does help. As always, pray for the church. I'm Anthony Stein. Ave Maria.